Okay. See if I can do another video here. This one might be the longest. Um, but a lot of uh, subject area to cover. I want to get really more in-depth on this whole deliberative democracy thing. Um, first of all, the terminology. Like, you'll hear deliberative democracy, there's uh, deliberative polling, there's um, it, in that book, Changing Maps, they call it public judgment. Um, there are public policy juries. Um, there's a, a few different, not quite synonyms, but uh, um, they're all similar in that they give power back to the citizenry. Um, in most cases, the ultimate yes or no still comes from the politicians, but when you have the citizenry um, actually deliberating and on uh, extremely important matters. Um, well, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so, books. I'll, I'll be uh, talking about another couple of books this time around. If you want to really know more about deliberative democracy, there's only one book that I can think of that's actually still in print and that's a book by James Fishkin who more or less invented the deliberative poll and the name of the book is called Democracy When the People Are Thinking really good um, and like I say, if, like changing maps is no longer in print. That's why I'm doing this really, is to try and get it in print again. Um, eh, what else? I'm going to ramble here a bit. Um, okay. The, uh, examples. Like actual examples, two of the best examples from Canada that have happened, you know, in the last 20 years. These these were about 15 years ago, um, and they were a citizens' assemblies in both BC and Ontario, and they were assembled to see if those provinces wanted to change their constitution so that the voting system would go to um, the, uh, the name escapes me now, I'll put it up there, but getting away from first past the post and going towards proportional representation. Um, So, yeah, like I say, that happened about, or those happened different years, but approximately 15 years ago. And uh, so, getting into how they actually functioned, how they um, were assembled in the first place. Oops. So, no, 
quite exact numbers, but in a, you know typical citizens assembly, you might get about a um, hundred people, and one of the really important things is, and these are people, uh, average citizens, but um, it has to be a representative uh, selection of citizens. So, if, and I'm just picking numbers out of the air here, if 1% of the population were homeless and 1% of the population were millionaires, and if you had a citizens assembly of 100 people, then on average, one of those people would be homeless and one would be uh, a millionaire. Um, so that's where representative comes in. Um, I may as well talk about the prerequisites. I'll be using a few acronyms here. Prerequisites for deliberative democracy or deliberative poll or citizens assembly, whatever. Um, that first one I just had, uh, representativeness. Uh, acronym is R-I-D for the other ones. Uh, I'll take the D second. Uh, it has to be deliberative. Like right now, we just have the uh, in the House of Commons in Canada, it's not deliberative. We just have, you know, a bunch of barking seals trying to get their uh, 15 seconds of fame on the evening news by saying bullying, uh, you know, whoever in the other party. They don't give a damn about um, actually getting things done. Uh, they get a damn. Their main objective is, you know, getting elected in four years' time or one year time, whatever. And uh, so there's zero impetus to even talk to the other side. In a deliberative manner but so that's where these uh, deliberative democracy comes in and uh, it is designed for deliberation um, the other the other initial in the acronym I is for influence these things have to have influence on policy uh, maybe whatever they come up with will become the policy or maybe the results will be in a very public manner plunked down on the leader's desk and they'll be told you know here's what the people say ignore it at your at your peril um, but it has to have influence um, and that's why getting back to the citizens assemblies in uh, BC and Ontario that's the one big flaw because after they did the citizens assemblies then they just tossed it back to a referendum referendums um, and referendums are not deliberative. Referendums are often uh, influenced by big money, special interests, yada yada yada. So you gotta watch out for stuff like that. Um, let's see now. Uh, second acronym is LET. Uh, L-E-T for th these are the reasons why deliberative democracy is better than what we have now uh, legitimacy 
and effectiveness and transparency legitimacy it may only be perceived legitimacy but perception is often reality in politics and uh, but you know if you have a rep representative uh, body deliberating that's pretty darn legitimate and it's a lot more legitimate than uh, the clown show we have now um, okay uh, that's legitimacy uh, transparency um, okay I'll get back into uh, okay I'll get effectiveness first and then transparency um, effectiveness because you have deliberation on all sides you know and between sides um, you tend to get better decision making it's the old saying two heads are better than one if two are better than one then 20 are better than two etc uh, it's the flow of information that helps. Uh, and transparency. Um, in the actual events, like on a, an assembly, a citizen's assembly, you know, you'll have, say, a hundred people in some big auditorium or conference center, and uh, most of it will be transparent i better i'll just turn around here and uh might have to do a probably have to do a wheelchair turn here we'll see mm, yes i always have to do a wheelchair turn at this point Terrible turning radius on this thing. It's worse than my Miata, literally. Uh, but can't be helped. I won't get into the technology and pros and cons of that right now. Okay, and where were we? Transparency. So. Um, in one of these assemblies, uh, it will be mostly transparent. You'll you will have you'll have small group discussions. You will have plenary sessions, and then you will have input from experts. Oftentimes, they'll be competing experts. Like, say, the big issue in Canada right now is carbon tax, and uh, it would be a really good subject for uh, both nationwide and provincial wide citizen assemblies to see what if anything we want to do about climate change but so on something like that you would have competing experts like you might on the one side you might have the Pembina Institute which is widely it's an environmental group but it's widely respected by business in the oil sands and whatnot because you know they they bow down to facts um, and then you have uh, another competing expert might be from the Canadian Taxpayers Association because uh, dealing with climate change will cost money let's face it um, so that stuff will all be transparent that can be relayed in a public manner to the wider public across the state across the province across the country no problem at all uh, the plenary sessions when well first of all I'll go to the small group discussions when the hundred people come in, hundred citizens come in, 
they're randomly assigned to tables scattered around. Usually the best number is about six or eight or ten people to a table max. And that's where the discussion of, you know, after you hear from the experts, you have some discussion amongst themselves. And there's going to be a wide variety of people. Like, and that's where the real magic happens. That's where, you know, you'll see someone the other side of the table. Whoa, this this guy is in the, in the uh, other political party. Uh, but then you realize, hey, he's in the other political party, but he's not an asshole. Wow. Like, and uh, he, he brings up... Oops. He brings up some good points. I forgot to button up here with my Velcro. Uh, let's do that first. Uh, so, yeah, these small group discussions, that's where the deliberation happens. That's where the magic happens. That's what is missing in our current system of politics. Um, and then are the, the plenary sessions when, you know, at, in the small group discussions, there will be, again, someone randomly assigned to be a chairperson so that no one is hogging uh, all the time in the small groups. And there will also be someone randomly assigned to be secretary to take down notes. And uh, so in plenary sessions, uh, each, each of the chair people, one at a time, will... Um, give the results or the discussion from the small groups and uh, feed it to the wider body and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, what else? No, 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 no. I'm gonna look at my note. I got some crib sheets here, and I know there's a lot of stuff on here that. Uh, okay, we did RID, we did LET. Uh, question: Read cartwheels and Graham Young. That's it. Okay. So, what we have now in question period. Um, uh, let's look at this again. Uh, yeah, so I already mentioned, you know, the problems with the question period, but the uh, other big problem is in Canada, especially because we don't have a, a separation of powers like we do now in the states. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, tremendous amount of um, concentration of power in the prime minister's office. The uh, MP backbenchers, they don't have anything to say. Well, they, they might have a lot to say because their constituents want them to say things and want their voices to be heard, but it's, uh, they can't because of the power in the PMO. Um, another good book is called Tragedy in the Commons, and it's all about this, the frustration of the MPs. And, uh, one of the people who has a lot of input into this book, Keith Martin, a uh, former reform MP for Esquimalt Juan of Yucca. He's, uh, I've given this changing map books to a few politicians over the years. He was the only one who seemed to understand what it was about and, and give me encouragement in what I'm doing. But uh, he's featured fairly well in this book, uh, Tragedy in the Commons. Um, so have a look at that. And in fact, he wrote, he wrote an opinion piece back many moons ago about comparing the power dynamics in the U.S. system versus the uh, Canadian system. And uh, he 
he said at the time, and I'm I'm pretty well quoting him word for word here now. I, I say pretty well, but he did use the word cartwheels. <laughs> uh, he said uh, if Bill Clinton had as much power as John Cretchen did, Bill Clinton would be doing cartwheels on the White House lawn. Um, yeah. So that's uh, the second big problem with our system. So deliberative democracy will tend to really, really flatten out that power curve. Um, I guess that's about it. So I will close off on this one.